Perfect. Welcome back, everyone. I'm chairing this session. I'm Emma Hatfield, one of the endocrinologists here at Imperial. I'm chairing it with Prof Palazzo. I think it's been a fantastic session so far. We have started the, this session slightly late, but we will um, have no issues with time. Bear with us. So um, please do feel free to um, ask questions at the end of the presentations. And we've got two fantastic speakers. I'm really looking forward to it. So without further ado, I'm going to um, introduce our first speaker, David Scott Coons, who's well known to many of us here. He's been a, a part of the team symposium since it was created by Fausto. And I can remember being at that first meeting where Fausto had the idea. And I congratulate you because it really has been fantastic from day one. And we're now into the um, a number of years I won't mention. Um, and without further ado, David, thank you for coming from Cardiff. Welcome. And we very much look forward to your talk, Surgical Strategies in Syndromic Pheochromocytoma. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, so thank you, Fausto, for uh, such a thrilling title. Uh, that I've had to work so hard on uh, to give this talk. Um, and uh, just to say that I have no conflicts of interest. So let us go straight to uh, three questions. And I'm going to ask these questions at the end as well. So I'm not going to tell you the answers uh, now. And this is to demonstrate either whether it, there's any value in me doing this talk at all and B, whether you might have learned anything at the end. Uh, so, in patients with inherited syndromes predisposing to pheochromocytoma, adrenal, or what's sometimes badly called cortical sparing surgery, should not be undertaken. Is that true or false? Okay. Uh, question two. The risk of malignancy is greater in paraganglioma than pheochromocytoma for all patients? A, true, B, false. And the third question, all of these people in the photos are surgeons. Assuming they all have an SDHB mutation, how many surgeons would have zero affected children? Okay, so I think that means there is, there is at least some merit in me speaking for the next 18 minutes. Uh, So um, I've been asked to speak on syndromic pheochromocytoma. What I'm not going to do is talk about um, head and neck paraganglioma. Neither am I going to talk about nuclear imaging. Neither am I going to talk about adjuvant treatment because each of those are lectures in themselves. So to begin with the highlight, you're all familiar, I hope, with the fact that we have two systems that regulate our homeostasis the endocrine system made up of discrete endocrine glands that secrete hormones under the influence of other hormones that have been secreted into the bloodstream. And then we have the neuroendocrine system, sometimes known as the diffuse neuroendocrine system, which is made up of glands spread throughout the body, including endocrine glands, which uh, also secrete hormones, but under the influence of nervous stimuli, um, hence neuroendocrine. And the shared characteristic of these tumors is that they are all amine producing, uptake, and decarboxylating. And we always used to think, um, a bit like crossing the placenta, all right, we always used to think that um, these cells were derived from the neural crest and then migrated out with the development of the embryo, but we now believe that they are all derived from uh, pluripotential uh, stem cells. Um, those tumors that arise from the neuroendocrine cells within the adrenal medulla are termed pheochromocytoma, 
and are abbreviated to PCC. And those that are outside the medulla, uh, mainly in the ganglionic tissue of the organ of Zucker candle, which is this sort of net of ganglionic tissue uh, over the anterior surface of the abdominal aorta, are known as paragangliomas. And together, they're abbreviated as PPGL. So uh, I hope it's forgivable, uh, Kareem and Fausto, that I'm actually talking about syndromic PPGL rather than just fear chromocytoma. And these tumors can be regarded to be either sympathetic or parasympathetic. The sympathoadrenal ones, as they're known, is make up, first of all, the, uh, those in the adrenal medulla and those in the, um, par the paragangliomas in the abdominal ganglionic tissue. And they tend to be uh, secreting uh, catecholamines, dopamine, whereas the parasympathetic tumors tend to have the majority clustered in the head and neck, the old chemodectoma, glomus tumors, all right? And they tend to be non-secreting, but a few are within the, ab within the abdomen as well. So syndromic PPGL is essentially a cluster of three cancer uh, predisposing syndromes, uh, MENVHL, NF1, and as of this morning, 13 gene mutations. And they can be thought of as being either genetic mutations in the mitochondrial respiratory chain leading to hypoxic-driven tumorigenesis, or gene mutations in the intracellular cell signaling cascade um, that regulates cellular proliferation. And this cartoon attempts to sort of demonstrate where the actions, uh, particularly the SDH within the mitochondria uh, and VHL, and then for the cell signaling pathway, RET, as you know, in the transmembrane, uh, tyrosine kinase receptor, NF1, et cetera. So we're probably much more comfortable with our knowledge of MEN2 uh, and 3, previously known as 2A and 2B, where we know everyone has a medullary thyroid cancer and 50% uh, of people have fear chromocytoma, so adrenal medullary tumors. Uh, where bilaterality is common. Um, interestingly, the presence of a fear chromocytoma may suggest a more aggressive MTC, and that's something that Neil and Tom, we need to think about. Um, and, uh, and it used to be that, that well, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that. Von Hippel-Lindau disease, you'll be, if you're taking the MRCP, you could, you'll have learned and probably now forgotten all the diseases uh, that are in this syndrome. But of the PPGL, okay, again, the majority of benign and are adrenal fear chromocytomas and bilaterality is again common. Uh, we subclassify uh, VHL1 into type 1 with a low risk of fear chromocytoma and take type 2 with a high risk of fear chromocytoma, and type 2 is further subcategorized according to whether there is a low or a high or a no risk of renal cell carcinoma. And then neurofibromatosis type 1, we're familiar with the clinical features, and in fact, PPGL are really quite a rare association with NF1, but again, most are FEOs that are benign. The succinate dehydrogenase mutations are responsible for the paraganglioma syndromes, of which there are five. But two, three, and four are spectacularly rare and uh, rarely have anything to do with abdominal um, PPGL, and so we can disregard. Whereas SDHD, all right, um, are associated with multiple head and neck tumors, um, which are non-secretory, as I've said, and occasionally uh, with abdominal tumors, which are usually benign. And SDHB accounts for um, abdominal tumors, and uh, many of which are multiple and malignant. And in fact, SDHB accounts for 
50% uh, of all malignant paraganglioma. I just need to quickly whiz up to something here to point out that SDHD uh, and SDHAF2 and MAX mutations all have a, an inheritance that favors a paternal um, transmission. The key word we heard was imprinting, um, which I suspect, Professor Trent, you know what that means, but I don't. And I have spoken to our uh, geneticist just last week and said, please give me a simple way of explaining how this paternal transmission works. And Frau Capel said to me, we don't know. So no questions, please, uh, to me about that. So the key points to summarize, all right, is that RET, uh, sorry, MEN2 and VHL are associated with pheochromocytomas that are rarely malignant and bilaterality is common. SDHD is predominantly to do with head and neck tumors, but within the abdomen, uh, you usually have benign paragangliomas, whereas SDHB is, is where we should be having a higher threshold for suspicion of malignancy. So now to the nub of the talk, the surgical strategies, and we can think of this through the, the classic principles of endocrine surgery, so in confirming the diagnosis, it's the relevant biochemical tests. For the patients who either have uh, symptoms of excess catecholamine or evidence of end organ damage, we then uh, prescribe um, medication to protect them from that, usually alpha blockade. It's very interesting. What do we do about screen detected uh, um, tumors uh, that don't have that end organ or, or uh, damage or evidence uh, of symptoms uh, like a 12 year old SDH? B, which we referred last week. Uh, localization, there's many, many ways to localize, but essentially it's usually now cross-sectional imaging, favoring MRI for the younger patient to avoid um, uh, ionizing radiation and uh, data tape PET scans. And so when we think about surgery, is it necessary and what approach? I would say it's not actually very dissimilar to the way we manage sporadic fear chromocytoma. That is to say, we tend to want to operate to rid the patient of the uh, burden, either by symptoms or uh, injury to end organ, damage, uh, end organ damage, if you like, of excess catecholamine secretion. And of course, we want to remove because there might be a risk of malignancy. And in terms of what operation are we going to do, we have to be very clear in our MDT heads of what our surgical intent is. For cure, you need to get an R0 resection, that is to say, no tumorous cells going to the margins, clear margins, uh, which can be achieved most of the time. But there may be a role for debulking surgery uh, to palliate the symptoms of excess catecholamine in those tumors that can't be completely resected, and it may facilitate peptide receptor radiolabeled treatment. So there are many factors to consider uh, when we think as surgeons about the approach. Where is it? If it's in the adrenal, is it unilateral or bilateral? If they're paragangliomas, are they multiple or single, singular? How big are these tumors? And what is the risk of malignancy influenced, obviously, by knowledge of the underlying mutation and the appearance on the imaging? And then there are certain patient characteristics. So as with all surgery now, everything is bespoke to the individual. And then the specific surgical considerations is just a really technical one. Can this be done minimally invasively with or without the robot that we just heard about? Or do we do open surgery? And for the um, pheochromocytoma, should we consider adrenal sparing surgery to avoid the burden of lifelong steroid dependence and the risk of Addisonian crisis? So here is a, a cartoon from um, Martin Valtz's paper, 
Martin has been a guest speaker uh, at these symposiums twice, and he has uh, unbelievable endoscopic skills, which a lot of fine surgeons struggle to match. Nevertheless, he published this paper on 42 children and adolescents with PPGL, uh, 70 tumors uh, in 42 patients, uh, and uh, you can see the spread of pheo and paraganglioma. And he attempted uh, endoscopic resection in all patients, only converting in two. And the color scheme tells us whether he's done it retroperitoneally, transperitoneally, or extraperitoneally. And mainly, he was guided by the anatomy of the great vessels uh, and the relationships therein. In terms of patient's characteristics, here you see a transabdominal ultrasound scan from uh, Newport Gwent of, uh, of a, a paraganglioma down in the pelvis. And here you see an adjacent calcified mass, which is the baby's uh, skull in this gravid uterus. Uh, and here is the paraganglioma at the confluence of the iliac veins and the IVC. And the concern was that as this uh, baby grew, it was going to compress and worsen the symptoms uh, of this catechols, uh, well, noradrenaline secreting tumor. So th this patient had open surgery uh, at 20 weeks. Uh, this is a 19 year old uh, a girl with SDHB mutation. And whilst the risk of malignancy is higher in these mutations, I do think that it's the imaging which really conveys either the suspicion of malignancy and also the, the surgical, surgical surgeon's decision making about whether to do this open or laparoscopically. This is the kidney, this is the tumor, the renal vessels are going straight near it. And this is something that personally I wouldn't undertake laparoscopically, and I didn't. This is uh, that patient's sister, all right? And here you see one tumor, again, horribly uh, associated to the right renal uh, artery here, and the second tumor, the bifurcation of the aorta, and down close to one of the polar arteries. Again, this, this patient had um, a laparotomy. Uh, this uh, max mutation is fabulously rare and one of those paternally transmitted and is often associated with multiple tumors that can be malignant. This patient actually presented in Swansea in 2019 with all the clinical features of a fear chromocytoma. And here is the right-sided tumor, which was successfully uh, removed laparoscopically by uh, our colleague Richard Egan in Swansea. Uh, um, and postoperatively, his catecholamines never normalized. And it took quite a lot of hunting uh, and a trip to London to finally find uh, the paraganglioma uh, down here, sitting on front of the aorta, which uh, was removed laparoscopically by my other colleague, Michael Stetchman, but only because the cameraman had such fantastic skills. Okay, now when it, when it comes to uh, adrenal sparing surgery, okay, MEN2 and VHL, I've told you twice now, are associated with multiple tumors, which are nearly always benign. So with that low risk of malignancy and high risk of bilateral disease, we really should be considering um, adrenal sparing surgery. That is to say a subtotal adrenalectomy, obviously removing the adrenal bit with the tumor in it. Um, and I really think that this should be first line surgery in unilateral disease. We've just been referred a patient with MEN2 um, who presented with, with a, as ever, a unilateral thyroid swelling, had a hemithyroidectomy and a pedullary, and she's, she also had hyperparathyroidism that was dealt with at the time. She's then had the genetic test and she's got a unilateral left-sided adrenal tumor, which is biochemically a fair chromocytoma. Uh, the other adrenal looks normal. I think that first adrenalectomy, if we can, should be subtotal, because the risk of this um, young 
23 year old I think getting a, a contralateral tumor is high all right and uh, interestingly the risk of recurrent theochromocytoma in MEN2 in the same adrenal is actually quite low it's not the inevitability that you might think with that mutation so to summarize ladies and gentlemen there's an awful lot of things to consider in the surgical strategies for the management of syndromic uh, PPGL listed here. And of course, the most important thing is that it's done with an MDT. This is a made up MDT of a very nice evening at the foot of the Acropolis. But there are pathologists and surgeons scattered in there. So finally, to the, uh, the questions again, you get a chance to see if you can get it right the second time, because some of you didn't first time. So in patients with inherited syndromes predisposing to FEO, adrenal sparing surgery should not be undertaken. Okay. Good. The answer is false. Uh, Green, do you want to go to the next one? So the risk of malignancy is greater in paraganglioma than FEO for all patients. Oh. Okay, so I failed. Right. The answer is true. And then finally, all of these people are surgeons. How many, if they all have SDHB, would have zero affected children? It's not to do with the number of people wearing glasses. All right, it's to do with the gender of the surgeon and its paternal transmission. So one, two, three, I think is the correct answer. Okay. Uh, this justifies yet another course <laughs> next year with a better speaker, I think. <laughs> okay, thank you for your time. I'll just first clarify, apologies. I didn't read your question properly about the inheritance you, where you put SDHB, SDHB has no imprinting, it's D. In it's case D. B, SDHB has no imprinting. I'm confused <laughs> you when I said imprinting, <laughs> so I just wanted to clarify because it's D. I just didn't read the question, so <laughs> can't do MCQs. But um, can I ask a question about the cortical sparing um, surgery? Because certainly I think this is not something that we see uh, many cases of, but the the pediatric cases that we've then subsequently inherited. Um, I have two VHL cases um, where they underwent uh, cortical sparing and always gets the recurrence. And it's actually quite a nightmare to manage in adulthood with the recurrence. I'm wondering if you could comment on that. Okay. Um, so my experience of that is zero. Um, and so, uh, but Tom is already at the microphone. Um, the, the, the literature evidence is really not very helpful. Most of it centers on um, MEN2, and it may be that that is very different. I don't know what your experience is, Fausto. Tom? I sort of a little bit disagree with the cortical sparing, and I want your take on that after, after I say what I think. First of all, there's no such a thing as cortical sparing. Anybody who dissected adrenal will know that there is one millimeter of cortex and one millimeter of, of medulla everywhere in the adrenal, full stop. If you're doing sparing surgery, you're going to leave it behind. And when, what is your reading of literature, David? Because I gave similar lecture a week ago, and I reviewed the literature, and actually the evidence is shockingly bad. Because only... The lower recurrences quoted are with the follow-up of up to five years. And there's only one paper which follows for 10 or 15 years, and that is 40%. You know, so, so, so suddenly you're going to the, the, the guest. So what, 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 do you, what do you think about whether actually we can conclude anything on the basis of the currently available literature? Yeah, okay, so first of all, I don't like the term cortical sparing, and I think it is disappearing from papers. It is adrenal sparing. Um, 
And of course, because of that, that's why there's a risk of recurrent fear chromocytoma. Um, the evidence is, is poor. Um, that is to say, there's very few papers. Uh, they, are, they are a mixture, but as I've just said, the majority is in MEN2. Uh, Jacoboni's probably got the best paper in terms of follow-up. He's quoting about 17%, I think, but there is a range. Fausto? Yeah, I think that it's worth saying, if I can make two comments on this. The first is that if you have MEN2A, the whole of the medulla is diseased. So it, it's it's either diseased at the time that you do the operation or it will be diseased later. So the, the risk of recurrence if, is, is high because exactly as Tom says, there isn't a medulla and the cortex. It, there's adrenal tissue, which we are a mixture of both. So if you go for a strategy of removing the tumor and leaving some adrenal tissue behind, the risk of recurrence is significant. Now, the longer you wait, the, the more likely you have recurrence. So that's the, that's the first thing. The second thing I'd say is that I, from my experience of Great Ormond Street recurrences, not many, but they have nothing to do with Tom, of course, is that mm -hmm. the idea of the pediatric surgeons is to do bilateral subtotal adrenalectomies, which is a nightmare because when the recurrence occurs, you go into a scarred field. It's better to have a recurrence only on one side and it's better to have the recurrence on the left because it is less likely that you could have potentially catastrophic hemorrhage during the operation if you're doing the operation laparoscopically in particular. So this, I don't agree with the idea that a first time fear chromocytoma on the right should be a adrenal sparing operation. I think I would prefer to do a total adrenalectomy on the right side. And then if the patient has a recurrence, then you can choose the strategy for the desires of that patient. And I totally uh, agree with the predominant view, mainly coming from the United States, that there is a mortality associated with doing a total bilateral adrenalectomy, which suggests that if you can preserve some adrenal function, it's certainly in the patient's best interest to do so. Um, having said that, the... So I'm sorry to go on. The, having said that, the, our teachers, our teachers on this, which is Kwan Du in particular, gives a description of, of how much adrenal tissue you need to leave. So if you take the adrenal vein, then you need to leave uh, more adrenal tissue. If you don't take the adrenal vein, then you can leave less adrenal tissue. This is a very approximate strategy, isn't it? So I think we have to be, it's, it's, a, it's a very invented operation when you do it. And sometimes even with all the will in the world, you can't find a bit of normal looking adrenal. Sorry to go on. So I, I agree with all of that. And, and I, ca I came with the attitude uh, before really reading the literature and getting so nagged by our endocrine colleagues that we don't want patients on steroids that it was intellectually dull to do subtotal in a patient whose adrenal is programmed to grow into tumors. So I find it quite surprising, albeit with the, uh, with the variance in the length of follow-up, but it doesn't appear to be inevitable. So I think it, it, it is a patient by patient um, thinking, and I agree about your views on left and right. And the index case I briefly referred to, she's presenting with a left sided FIO, which isn't that big. So that's why I think we should be thinking about that because of the right side later. To sort of life imitating art, I mean, I just operated on, on a boy uh, I used to, uh, I looked after the last 20 years. So the people, the children I did. Uh, prophylactic thyroidectomies are now coming up with with fear chromocytoma so they did the right completion and 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 i think that what you've said is is absolutely true now i have to tell you that on a practical level because whatever people write is sort of one thing but on a practical level when i meet the families of men2 and i meet quite few of them if the parent had a bilateral adrenalectomy i have never seen a parent with adrenal sparing you know, almost everybody I meet, they had a bilateral adrenalectomy, so then on a practical level. Okay. Well, I, I think it's a new thing. I think it is, it's, a, it's a live, live a, a debate that never happened before. 
Thank you very much, David. Now, over the years, we've had many distinguished speakers at this meeting, and this year is no different. Uh, this year, we have uh, Professor Jan Zadenius from the Karolinska in Institute in Stockholm. Um, I should say, uh, uh, full disclosure, I I've known Jan for uh, a very long time. Uh, we met, we met uh, in a sliding doors moment for the Department of Endocrine Surgery, you might say, because it was a time when I was a registrar and I was looking for career support. And most of the career support I had received until that point was give up. So, <laughs> <laughs> because, because endocrine surgery is a rarefied specialty, there are very few jobs. And your, uh, if I can quote uh, the, uh, the, uh, the RETA assessment in Oxford, it was, you're training yourself into unemployment. Good luck. Um, then, I met, then I met Jan on a train at the Millennium Meeting, a fusion meeting, the BAETS, British Association of Endocrine Surgeons, with the American Association, which was between St. Thomas's Hospital and Lille. And we were on the train. He might not even remember this. We we're on the train, and I was saying to him, you know, how, what do I do? And he said, well, what you need to do is you need to go and do a really good fellowship. And Jan did the TS Reef Fellowship, which is the high, most competitive English-speaking clinical fellowship in endocrine surgery in Sydney. And he introduced me to who ran the fellowship. And I went later to do that fellowship. And Amy DeMarco has also done that fellowship. So Jan, had it not been for you, the Department of Endocrine Surgery at Hammersmith would look very different. <laughs> so, um, I'm not going to say anything more than that and just say thank you. Thank you for coming. And um, we really look forward to hearing your, your talk. Thank you so much, Fausto, for those kind words. I have to apologize. Uh, having listened to all the beautiful English-British accents so far, we will now turn to my natural uh, dialect, Swinglish. So. Anyone has seen the ABBA show here in London? Uh, few. I'm not an avatar. Not all Swedes are avatars. I do remember the occasion 2000 on the train. It's very easy to get to know Fausto quickly and to become very good friends, which we became on that train year 2000. We were young and promising at the time. Now I'm just and. I've been asked to talk about new algorithm in the treatment of aggressive thyroid cancers. And thank you, Fausto, for suggesting this. And thank you for the, to the rest of uh, the organizers for taking care of this. Karim, thank you very much. Uh, uh, this idea, um, uh, uh, this title uh, does not refer to very much surgery, although I'm an endocrine surgeon. There are two reasons for that. One is that I don't have very much to teach the brilliant surgeons here about the surgical procedures. And uh, it's not the surgical algorithms that have changed lately and made the situation for these patients different. Uh, maybe the time of surgery, which I will come back to. I do have a disclosure. I am so-called scientific advisor for a company called Akiram Therapeutics. This is a, not a paid uh, uh, title at all, has no economy behind it, but I will mention this company towards the end of my talk, so therefore I state this. This uh, background slide is known to uh, virtually all of you, I'm sure. It's the most, uh, thyroid cancer is the most common endocrine malignancy, and uh, uh, in the United States, there are more than 50,000 cases each year. In my country, there are more than 800 cases on a, a, a population of 10 million. I suppose here in uh, England, it would be uh, five or 6,000 cases per year, that's right. There is an increasing incidence that we all already heard from uh, Tom uh, describing the situation among children. Uh, and we, uh, of course, it's partially due to uh, more imaging, but that could not be the only explanation because it's not only the small T1 and T2 tumors that are increasing, it's also the T3 tumors. Uh, that are increasing, and it's the same increase for men and women, et cetera, et cetera. 
Thyroid carcinoma has a very variable clinical cause. Papillary thyroid cancers in young patients, uh, they have the same life expectancy almost as if they uh, never had the cancer. Whilst in the anaplastic thyroid carcinoma, the, uh, uh, it's mankind's probably worst cancer with uh, a survival which uh, is less than that of pancreatic adenocarcinomas. Most of the thyroid cancers are papillary uh, carcinomas. It varies a little bit uh, from where you come, but uh, uh, that's the situation. The number of medullary thyroid carcinomas and anaplastic thyroid carcinomas, to my knowledge, has not increased in the same rate as the differentiated thyroid cancers, which to me says that there must be something in our environment that causes the differentiated uh, thyroid cancers to increase in such a steep way. These are Swedish figures, and I apologize for that, but uh, you can, I will uh, describe for you what it means. Uh, this is uh, 40 years of uh, incidence figures, about 100,000 inhabitants. As you can see, the light blue line is for females. Uh, Around uh, the millennium meeting, when Fausto and I met on the train, uh, four uh, cases uh, per 100,000 female cases is now up to 14, which is more than uh, three times as many. But it's the same for men, uh, down to two, and now it's six per 100,000 men that get a th uh, uh, thyroid cancer. You see a dip here around 2020, probably attributed to the COVID pandemic. Uh, the same dip is not seen by men. What, uh, what that tells me, I don't know. Uh, the lower lines, the dotted lines, that's uh, um, uh, death from thyroid cancer. As you can see, it's almost half uh, uh, late years compared to the 1980s. So although the incidence is rising, death from thyroid cancer is lower than it used to be. This is the relative survival during the same period of time. As you can see, it approaches 95% for, for women. These are all thyroid cancers, uh, not just differentiated. If we selected only papillaries, the numbers would, see, would be even better, of course. Okay, so anaplastic thyroid cancer. The incidence is roughly three to five million inhabitants per year. So we see in Sweden uh, 50 cases in our country, at least those that come to di diagnosis and uh, treatment is discussed, then they end up in a registry. Uh, so there is a, a, a black, uh, what do you say? This could be a little bit of uh, tip of the iceberg, there can be more cases out there that we don't recognize. Uh, I, I suppose this means that you have roughly six times more uh, here. So 200 cases per year, something like that. Age is usually older than other thyroid cancers, usually uh, above 70 years of age. The youngest patient I've seen, my, I've had myself, was a 46-year-old lady, uh, a female colleague of mine, which was a dreadful experience. Uh, and but there are no major sex differences; a little bit more females than males, and maybe that's uh, uh, explained by uh, that uh, anaplastic thyroid cancer is quite often preceded by long-standing goiter, and the prognosis is dismal considered mankind's worst, at least 10, 20 years ago. Anaplastic thyroid cancer is by definition always stage four, regardless of the T and M uh, classification, the stage is always four. And uh, uh, the smaller tumors, uh, T1 and T3, uh, are stage four A. Uh, Stage 4C are those with distant metastasis, and then there is an in-between group with advanced, locally advanced cancers or metastasis uh, in the region, in the neck region, but not distant metastasis. And uh, from uh, a large study in the United States, we can see that the majority 
at diagnosis are 4C. That means they already have distant metastases. And only roughly 10% 10, 10 are those that are only in the thyroid gland. Maybe they are discovered uh, by chance. Uh, that is not presented in the paper, but the cohort is large. This is the Swedish algorithm that we have used for many decades until quite recently, and I would try to explain it. We um, gave these patients radiotherapy, external radiation, in a very aggressive program with uh, um, uh, hyperfractionated, accelerated radiation during three weeks. Uh, and then uh, given them Dr. Rubicin or lately Paclitexel to uh, uh, facilitate the radiation effect, so a very low dose just to uh, as a radio sensitizer. And two weeks after the radiotherapy uh, treatment was stopped, there is a window of opportunity to remove the primary tumor, which we have done also in 4C cases where it has been possible. Uh, and this material, which is quite old material, but it's uh, from our institution, 36 out of 59 patients could fulfill this, uh, this regimen. And uh, of these that were operated, only one suffered from local advanced disease at the time of death. Uh, the rest died from metast metastatic disease, and a few were cured. Uh, so, uh, but not all patients can tolerate this very heavy treatment. Uh, at the end of the uh, radio treatment, they often need feeding tubes, etc. So here are the results, and what do they tell us? Well, first of all, of course, surgery is better than no surgery. There's a heavy um, uh, bias uh, in those figures, but some do uh, survive. Uh, long have a long-term survival, but we're down to approximately 10-12% in this material. Uh, so, uh, again, we consider this operation to be a palliative operation to avoid the extremely difficult situation with a slow strangling tumor for the last two or three months of their lives. I've seen a few patients die from local advanced disease, and I never want to experience that again. It's dreadful. So if you can remove the primary tumor, it is of benefit to the patient. That was why we have used this protocol until recently. So what has been the change? Well, that's the molecular landscape of thyroid cancers and also anaplastic thyroid cancers. Again, the inner circle, the blue circle, uh, the resectable tumors are not that many uh, in the primary setting, 10% um, roughly, and the majority are four Cs. They have quite commonly... Uh, some mutations, the most common being the TERT promoter mutation. To my knowledge, there is uh, today no drug that addresses this. Uh, there might be in the pipeline. There are some experimental drugs, but not yet available. Uh, to my knowledge, there are no uh, drugs that address P53 mutations that are very common in these cancers as well. RAS mutations are common, but, uh, and there are uh, RAS inhibitors on the market, but it's not the KRAS mutation we see uh, in other cancers, in pancreatic cancers, colon cancers. It's usually the NRAS and HRAS mutations. But there are druggable mutations, some rare ones that can be found in anaplastic thyrocarcinomas, and one quite common one, the BRAF mutation, that in America uh, is seen in 45% of the anaplastic thyroid cancers. In my country, it's only 20%. Uh, I cannot explain that. And in the outer circle, you see uh, PDL1 uh, expression is quite common in anaplastic thyroid cancer. And that is indicative of possibility to treat these tumors with immunotherapy. But the Game changer was the discovery of BRAF mutations in this tumor because there are uh, BRAF and MEK inhibitors you can give the patients 
uh, that are very, very effective and with comparably few side effects. So this was a that was the change. And this is a cartoon just showing you how many potential targets there are in an, in an anaplastic thyroid cell. There are so many tyrosine kinase inhibitors and other inhibitors that we have uh, in the armamentum that we can potentially use once we catch one of these targets. I will come back to some of these. But again, it was the BRAF that really uh, changed the situation. Dabrafenib in combination with trametinib or vemurafenib uh, in combination with cobimetinib. Hopeless names, uh, but this is what is used by our oncology uh, colleagues. So uh, the activating port mutations in BRAF uh, is quite common, as I said, probably uh, it is a de-differentiated PTC because an anaplastic thyroid carcinoma uh, is an undifferentiated carcinoma and quite often seems to be developed from either a papillary thyroid carcinoma with a BRAF mutation or a follicular thyroid carcinoma, for instance, with a RAS mutation. Uh, you can detect BRAF mutations on fine needle aspiration uh, cytologies, uh, both molecular and immunohistochemical. Uh, I'm very spoiled with very good cytology at my institution. Cytology was actually invented at the Karolinska Hospital. Uh, and uh, we have cytologists that do nothing else than cytology. And we get a, a BRAF mutation answer of, within four, uh, 24 hours, uh, PCR-based. Immunohistochemistry takes a little longer time. And this is, of course, predicted for target, targeted treatment. So we ask for that immediately. And you can use this neoadjuvant. And to me, um, uh, to the best of my knowledge, this is the first case, which is uh, uh, from the United States, presented 10 years ago in New England Journal of Medicine with a widespread anaplastic thyroid carcinoma inoperable and with, uh, as you see, thousands of metastases in the lungs. And um, this patient, it was a male, uh, was treated with uh, BRAF and MEK inhibitors and the tumor was gone and the patient was operated, but then later developed recurrence. Uh, Raw the basket trial has been a large trial looking at various cancer with BRAF mutation because uh, it's not only thyroid cancers that can contain BRAF mutations. Uh, it's actually it was first found in uh, malignant melanoma, but they occur in lung cancers, colorectal cancers, etc. But uh, anaplastic thyroid cancers were, were, were uh, included in the Raw basket trial, and this is uh, a. Um, uh, a cartoon show, a figure showing the dramatic effects in some patients with actually a complete response in several patients. Incredibly uh, effective. And the response comes within days and weeks, which is also unusual, uh, for instance, for tyrosine kinase inhibitors. It's a very quick response, so you can judge quite soon. And the side effects, as I mentioned, are not that many. So this led to a new algorithm presented by the American Thyroid Association and the uh, very world famous uh, American design, I think has not reached the American Thyroid Association because this is not easy to uh, digest. So I will skip that one. Uh, this is uh, our new program uh, back home uh, um, that is very straightforward and not uh, uh, very different from the American program. Very urgent processing is uh, absolutely mandatory for these patients. As quick as possible, you should have a diagnosis and a workup. So um, the minimal diagnostics are a CT on the neck, chest, and abdomen, and then you can consider PET to look for, uh, FTG PET to look for distant metastasis, fibroscopy, should you 
uh, um, have a risk of ingrowth to the esophagus or the trachea. MR, if you wish, and if the patient has neurological symptoms, which is not unique, uh, of course, a CT of the brain. Um, resectability, uh, is it possible to get an RO operation? That has to be judged by a very experienced thyroid surgeon and a multidisciplinary conference, including radiologists, oncologists, and palliative thyroid surgeons. A lot of these patients are very old and have heavy comorbidity, so it might be the wisest choice to just go to palliation and nothing else, best supported care. But we do have the targeted therapy, which is a novel uh, um, event in the last 10 years or so. So we ask for mutation at analysis in all these uh, genes. And soon, of course, next generation sequencing will be applied for all of these patients. What we want to uh, uh, achieve as quick as possible is the BRAF answer, because that could help us for neoadjuvant treatment of these patients, and also the possibility to give immune immunotherapy, and that can today, to my knowledge, only be achieved by immunohistochemistry, the expression of PDL1. Not uh, That's not a molecular test. So this is my poll question number one. A 78-year-old lady with tender nodule approximately as an apple, right lobe of the thyroid, Rapid growth uh, since three months, and last month she's been hoarse and even difficult to swallowing. What is your preferred investigation up front? Would you ask for a fine needle aspiration biopsy or a core needle biopsy? It's almost 50-50, and uh, that, that's quite good because uh, that's how it is. Um, uh, a lot of cytologists... So I cannot make a diagnosis 100% uh, uh, secure on a fine needle. I want a core needle biopsy. That's quite common. The pathologist asks for that themselves uh, because they want to see the architecture, et cetera, et cetera. And there are difficulties in uh, differentiating them from some lymphomas, et cetera, squamous cell carcinomas that could be an anaplastic variant. So uh, it depends on where you are. Uh, at my institution, again, cytology is fine. Uh, they are never um, hesitant to set the diagnosis ATC. But we would like to uh, do more core biopsies for the reason of uh, that we can do immunohistochemistry chemistry on these. So we can get more information and we can do more molecular testing on them. Um, uh, at the, uh, again, at the Karolinska, the cytologists do the cytology, but if we want a core needle biopsy, we must ask an ultrasound radiography doctor to do the core needle biopsy. So uh, it's not the same quick passage for these patients. So we start with a fine needle biopsy almost always. Okay. So there is uh, another question, should I... Now, this is the same situation, but this lady is on no work related to atrial fibrillation. Now, what is your preferred investigation up front? Fine needle aspiration biopsy, core needle biopsy, or do you have to wait three days or two days uh, before you do any biopsy? This is not an uncommon situation today. You know, few would do a core needle biopsy, and I think that's wise because there is a risk of hemorrhage after core needle biopsy. Fine needle biopsy, very low risk still. Uh, even if they're on warfarin, we do uh, fine needle biopsies, and we have, of course, seen a few hemorrhages, but uh, uh, not uh, hard to handle. You don't have to wait until you get the diagnosis provided uh, you, you have a cytologist who can do the fine needle uh, diagnostics. So this is not a very easy to digest flowchart either, uh, but I will try to highlight some things. Most people are 4C. You have to judge, are they fit for treatment? And not all are. 
And then you have to decide is, are we going to palliative uh, radiotherapy or is it possible to apply systemic treatment? That's the first choice. To do surgery on these patients up front is heroic and of little benefit to almost all patients. You end up in, sometimes in disaster with uh, locally uh, aggressive recurrences in the neck with tracheostomy, which is a situation you absolutely want to avoid because uh, the end of their life will be um, uh, uh, not nice. Try to avoid tracheostomies in these patients. Okay, if they have a BRAF mutation, it's straightforward. You ask the uh, oncologist for uh, systemic treatment. But it's also possible uh, if you don't have any targets uh, to do radiotherapy combined with low dose of chemotherapy. And then you should, uh, down the track, consider palliative resection if the response is fav favorable, either on systemic treatment or radiotherapy or other targeted target therapy should you have that possibility to avoid the dreadful dead of strangling. If you have a possibility to do RO resection up front, and if you have uh, a wild type, uh, you don't have a mutation in BRF, of course, you go for primary resection. Uh, and then you can do palli uh, sorry, uh, adjuvant uh, uh, intensity modulated radiotherapy combined with chemotherapy. If you have a BRAF mutation, you have a possibility to neoadjuvantly treat this patient, although you judge it to be resectable, to make it even an easier operation and to see that it is uh, uh, treatable with these compounds. Or you can wait, of course because there is a risk of developing resistance to BRAF inhibitors and MEK inhibitors. We now know that five years down the track. And again, uh, the, two, uh, uh, the 4B uh, situation, uh, you do re-evaluation -eva if it is resectable, and uh, of course, you try to operate for these uh, patients uh, uh, if you can. These are um, figures from MD Anderson in this very large cohort. And as you can see, in the late uh, years, the blue line here, the survival is 40% after two years, which is totally different figures than we experienced just 10, 15 years ago. Uh, it's a slight bias here because these are the patients that were treated. Uh, but of those that are possible to treat, you have a two-year survival of 40%. It's a game changer. Now to totally different uh, attitude, but um, uh, in the same, uh, uh, it's in the vicinity of what I've just talked about. And these slides were presented in the Chicago meeting just a month ago, and I borrowed them from Mark Siwak, who is in the at the University of Sydney, in the um, in the center which we had our fellowship, me and Fausto Palazzo. And the background is, of course, that some anaplastic, and in this case also medullary thyroid cancers, are inoperable at presentation. But there are reports of new adjuvant targeted molecular tr treatment that can change the situation for these patients. And this is what this is about. And it's a very small series, only four cases, but the concept is of interest. Two medullary and two anaplastic. The two anaplastic uh, were very... Um, advanced, and one had several lymph node metastases. Uh, and the medullaries were also, of course, advanced and judged inoperable by these very skillful surgeons. The MTC patients harbored a, a somatic RET mutation, uh, uh, and the ATCs, uh, one had an NRAS mutation in the primary tumor, and they both had somatic P10 and P53 mutations, so no BRAF mutations. And they were given new adjuvant lenvatinib, one of all these tyrosine kinases, uh, which is uh, uh, used for uh, radio uh, refractory uh, differentiate thyroid cancers also, and in some cases also for anaplastic uh, cancer, uh, thyroid cancers. 
They had uh, a neoadjuvant uh, lamvatinib, and the volume reduction of the primary tumors was 70%. Uh, and the side effects were tolerable in these patients. And both uh, uh, medullaries could uh, have a total thyroidectomy and uh, lymph node dissection, and the ATCs underwent hemithyroidectomy, and there is no reason to do total thyroidectomy uh, uh, provided the tumor is situated at, in one lobe. You don't have to take out the other lobe because you won't give, give these patients uh, radioactive iodine, and it's almost never a multifocal tumor. So they had central lymph node dissection, and in the second case, uh, also lateral neck uh, lymph node dissection. And the survival is only one of these patients have died with quite a long follow-up. Uh, one HEC patient died from liver metastases after uh, 15 months or so, but one is alive. I spoke to Mark, and uh, uh, she's alive uh, three years now, I think. So the conclusion from this group, the use of neoadjuvant kinase inhibitors such as lenvatinib has the potential to revolutionize the treatment paradigm for patients with advanced ATC and MTC. And that's very promising in my, in my opinion. The BRAF mutation is even more efficient. So poll question number three, you have a left-sided ATC, uh, the size is four or five centimeters, and you judge it to be possibly resectable, but you're not uh, absolutely convinced because you cannot see a layer between the tumor, the trachea, and the esophagus. There's no ingrowth, but you cannot see a layer. You plan for a primary resection, and then you get a report that shows a BRAF mutation. What will be your choice? Do the operation first? or ask for BRAF MEC inhibitors. Great, I would too, uh, because it will change your operation considerably, most likely, if they respond to treatment, which most of these patients do, not all, but most respond to treatment. And as I mentioned, you can quite soon judge if they respond or not within a week or two weeks, you can say, this is a non-responder. Now we'll turn over to something very different, uh, the last part of my talk. This is the first time I present this project, so you bear with me if it's not crystal clear. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. It's the first time this is presented outside Sweden also, so um, it's a bit of a thrill. Um, this is antibody-based molecular radiotherapy for anaplastic thyroid cancer. And uh, you may all know how this is uh, uh, conducted. You have a tumor cell with a presenting antigen epitope, and you produce antibodies somehow connected to uh, a, a, an isotope that causes uh, radiation. A normal cell should have no or very little expression of this antigen, of course, otherwise you will experience severe side effects. The goal and strategy for this project, which I've been working in the last four or five years, uh, is treatment of refractory thyroid cancer. And uh, the strategy is a radio-labeled CD44 V6, V6 targeting antibody for molecular radiotherapy. And I will come back to what CD44 V6 is, of course. Uh, as you know, uh, molecular radiotherapy is not novel. Uh, this is uh, um, uh, the uh, lutetium dotatate uh, study uh, from a couple of years ago that really showed progress progression-free survival in those patients that received uh, this compound, the molecular radiotherapy, compared to controls, a huge difference. And later studies also have shown survival differences. It works. This is not an antibody. This is a somatostatin receptor analog, but uh, it's the same concept. As is uh, this, uh, which is um, uh, similar treatment for uh, disseminated prostate cancer, where you can show uh, that the overall survival increases in those patients treated. So uh, the concept is not novel, but the agent is novel. 
So the antigen CD44 V6, we discovered the expression of that in anaplastic cell lines almost by coincidence, mm -hmm. looking for other things, actually. Uh, it is a splice variant of CD44, which is a well-known uh, <clears throat> membrane <clears throat> uh, receptor, uh, uh, sorry, surface protein. This splice variant is displayed on several cancer cell types, uh, mostly epithelial uh, uh, derived, but not in normal tissue, luckily, apart from kerat keratinocytes in the skin. And we direct uh, the treatment towards a variable region in this uh, molecule. So we'll uh, start by uh, treating anaplastic uh, thyroid uh, cancer patients, advanced thyroid cancers, because more than 50% uh, actually uh, of the anaplastic thyroid cancers express this variant, the CD44 V6. And papillary thyroid cancers, all of them express this. So um, if you cannot treat them with the radioactive iodine, this is a possibility. Of course, you have tyrosine kinase inhibitors as well. But there are other cancers that express this. Uh, these are very rare cancers, uh, but much more common cancers also express this target, which is possible to attack uh, with this uh, antibody. It has been used 20 years ago for a head and neck cancer. Uh, it was another uh, antibody, obviously, and was also an, another isotope, uranium. Uh, but that was 20 years ago, and uh, uh, no company wanted to invest in this. It was too early. Uh, it was in the beginning of molecular radiotherapy, so it never, it never, was never presented uh, other in in a paper. So uh, we have a core facility in our country called SciLife Labs, Science for Lab, Life Labs Laboratories. That's a core facility that is, exists in all university hospitals. And we can ask them either by a joint venture where we uh, get researchers together and do projects together, or you can buy what you want if you have juicy grants. We didn't have that many juicy grants, so we have done this as a, a cooperation. And we ask them for antibodies towards CD44 V6. And I won't go all uh, through all the steps, obviously. But what you want is a selection of purity to characterize how they work, affinity maturation, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, we must also be able to radio label these antibodies. We must have specific specificity assays and look how they um, how they seem to be distributed on imaging. And these are mice that have anaplastic thyroid cancers injected in the thighs. Uh, so we can see that it lights up on, on, on a scan. And uh, you look at the biodistribution and we selected this specific Akir-1 antibody because it had a very high level in the tumor in contrast to in the bone marrow, which is much lower. So uh, you must um, look at this as a, a drug. Uh, so you have to do development uh, as, as you are inventing a new drug. You have to look at stability during storage, of course, side effects, and that you can produce it. Otherwise, it's all in vain. And this has been validated on thyroid, head and neck uh, cancers and lung can uh, cancer patient materials on immunohistochemistry. Uh, so we have a lead candidate and we've used this on animal experiments. And uh, of course, in mice, it's very black and white. Uh, reality won't be, but all the patients, I was going to say, all the mice that were treated with this antibody with uh, connected to letitium, they survived and all the controls died. It's, it's the same figures, but uh, presented in another, in another way. But we had to repeat this several times, of course, and we choose other uh, aggressive ATC cancer models. And again, all the treated animals were cured and all the non-treated animals died. 
Then we have, have to look at toxicity. So we've been looking at rabbits and Pseudomolgus, which is a monkey uh, with the same uh, uh, CD44 V6 uh, construct as in human beings. And uh, there is no uptake uh, where it should not be an uptake, which is very, very promising. So what we're now looking at is we've, we've finished the regulatory toxicology. Uh, we are producing candidates for clinical studies. Uh, so in the beginning of next year, January or February, uh, we will treat the first patient and we have to uh, choose an anaplastic thyroid cancer because that's what uh, the ethical uh, committee has allowed us to start with because we don't have anything else to, to offer these patients. We will do Im imaging study, immunohistochemistry, and if they express this antigen, we will give them treatment uh, in a phase one fashion. If this is sufficient, of course, we will do a phase two uh, basket study with other cancers. Uh, so um, this is a project... Uh, which has been led uh, the basic science part by Marika Nestor in Uppsala, which is 70 kilometers north of Stockholm. And I've been uh, a PI for the clinical part, but there, there are many people involved, of course. And we are uh, very enthusiastic about this, of course. Otherwise, we would have stopped many years ago. So my last poll question is this. Now, having seen all these preclinical data, how much do you wish to invest in Akiram Therapeutics Limited shares? Akiram, if you read it backwards, it's Marika, and that's the first name of the uh, basic science PI, Marika Nestor. So five pounds, 5,000 pounds, or 500,000 pounds? Not bad. I have some contracts down at the coffee center. <laughs> yeah. Uh, wonderful. I got a question, and I saw a question here. What is PRRT different from molecular uh, radioactive therapy? Um, PRRT is uh, a kind of molecular radiotherapy, so there is no difference. The difference here is we're using antibodies and uh, uh, PRRT, a peptide receptor uh, directed rather than uh, antibodies. So with this, I thank you so much for your attention and I'm happy to answer any questions during lunch. Mm -hmm.